Welcome to Thursday's edition of COVID-19. We are recording a second day of new infections on the 700 level as the world marks Earth Day today. Now we have more on this global day for action against the climate crisis after a look at the COVID-19 crisis worldwide with our Kwon Soa. Now Soa, I believe there's been a rise in cases today here in Korea. Yes, Sunny, there has been a slight uptick in cases this Thursday to 735 infections as of 12 a.m. That's the highest figure in 105 days. Back then, the number was in the 800s. Domestic transmissions have also risen to the 700s with a decline in imported cases. Now, compared to the huge jump we had here from Tuesday to Wednesday, we only have four more cases compared to yesterday, but we are seeing an on-week rise uh, from the highest 600s to the 700s. And with that, the average in domestic infections in the past week stands at 625, and the total number of infections is at 116,661. If we take a look at our map now, we do see that we are seeing new cases spread across the country, uh, most serious here in the capital, Seoul and Gyeonggi-do province, over 200 infections. And also here in the southeast, Busan and Gyeongsangnam-do province are seeing a relatively high figure. Right, so and against that backdrop, I understand the government is looking into the possibility of rolling out new vaccine products. Right, Sunny, following an order by President Moon Jae-in to review the possible introduction of Russia's Sputnik V vaccine, Korea's drug regulator has made a formal request to Seoul's foreign ministry to retrieve information from a dozen countries that are currently using this vaccine. Uh, authorities meanwhile predict that uh, this Thursday uh, we will hit um, 2 million in vaccinations here in the country, currently at 1.9 million. And also we are expecting more people to get their second shot uh, because it's been three weeks since the vaccination program for those aged 75 and above has begun. Over in the U.S., President Joe Biden celebrated a 200 million shot milestone, which was his goal for the first 100 days in office. Uh, despite the fast vaccination process, though, helping other nations with possible vaccine um, swaps does not appear to be his focus right now, as, uh, but rather getting the U.S. prepared for possible contingencies. Now, over in Germany, this country is getting prepared for stronger lockdown measures, including the permission mission to implement a night uh, curfew, nighttime curfew that is across the nation uh, as uh, the country has been drawing up uh, a new law, but it has not been welcomed by some activists who are saying this goes against their freedom. Now, the number of infections in Germany currently stands at 3.2 million uh, with over 27,000 new cases there. And Turkey, meanwhile, has surpassed the total figure of the UK in cases with 4.4 million infections and very serious here in India, almost at 16 million, record after record every day. Now India has uh, reported over 300,000 infections in the span of just a day. And we're also seeing an overall rise in cases with more than 889,000 infections reported in the past day. And those are the updates I have for now. I'll be back in a bit after the government briefing. Sunny? All right, so well, thank you for now. And back on the domestic front, officials have vowed to tighten COVID-19 prevention measures within the academic arena following a surge in cases there since its opening early last month. Now, for more on this, I have our Lee kyung here in the studio with me. Welcome, kyung -un. Hi, Sunny. Right then, let's start with the latest efforts to ensure safety at schools. Yes, the government has decided to go into a three-week special containment period for all schools. This comes after some 2,000 cases have been reported among students and teachers since the spring semester began last month. During this period, the government will carry out thorough inspections at places of learning, including schools, universities, and private academies until May 11th. The government has outlined five major prevention rules, uh, which are are mask wearing, frequent hand washing, social distancing, early testing, avoiding crowded areas, and eating in designated locations. Take a listen. Of the five main guidelines, the most important rule is getting tested for COVID-19 when symptoms appear and staying at home until you have negative test results. 
the ministry is also looking to prevent an outbreak at university campuses by dispatching ministry workers who will be working with the faculty and staff to keep campuses safe. Together, they will make sure important messages and guidelines are communicated swiftly for the safety of everyone on campus. Right, and Kyung and I hear students and teachers here in the metropolitan region are being offered greater access to COVID-19 testings. Yes, the ministry will start dispatching um, special testing teams to schools. They'll be comprised of three professional medical teams and they'll provide COVID-19 testing to anyone who wants it, even if they don't have any symptoms. These mobile testing teams will make sure that screening is readily available for students and teachers without having to visit a designated test site. The government hopes this will help with the early detection of cases. This allows testing to be more accessible for elementary, middle and high school students. Also, it can help us identify patients at an early stage and curb the possible spread of the virus. For now, these mobile testing teams will only operate in the hardest hit capital region, but will be adopted nationwide after a successful trial run. Earlier this month, the Seoul mayor also suggested the rollout of self-administered test kits to make testing easier and even more accessible. But this proposal is now in limbo over concerns that the kits may not be accurate enough. Right, and on a more optimistic note then, now despite the persistent infection numbers we've been seeing here in the country, I understand Korea has been witnessing fewer severe cases, right? Yes, the total number of cases may be on the rise, but the number of severe cases has been on the decline. Um, um, during the peak of the third wave, um, back in January, um, there were over 400 patients who were seriously ill, but now that figure has dropped to the 100 range. Um, Severe cases now take up only about 1.6% of active cases, dropping from the 3.3% refo reported last December. The fatality rate is also on decline. The government said thanks to locally developed COVID-19 treatments, the number of daily deaths um, now remain in the single digits compared to some 40 during the peak of the third wave. With that, Korea now has one of the lowest fatality rates in the world from COVID-19. Take a listen. Korea has confirmed a total of 1,806 deaths from COVID-19 since the start of the outbreak, with the fatality rate standing at 1.56 percent. That is equivalent to three and a half people out of every one million. It is the second lowest death rate among OECD countries just behind New Zealand. But to calculate the real burden of the pandemic on society, experts say excess mortality may give us some important hints. Excess mortality is the difference between the number of deaths in a given time period and the average number of deaths in the same period from the past few years. This could help us give a better idea of the true numbers of deaths from COVID-19 beyond cases that are officially documented, as well as fatalities caused indirectly from COVID-19. Statistics show a total of some 308,000 deaths were reported in Korea last year. That's about a 3% increase from the lowest record and 0.3% lower than the highest record in the past three years. Authorities say this indicates that Korea has not seen meaningful excess mortalities from COVID-19. I see that's quite fortunate then. All right, Kelwin, thank you for that coverage. My pleasure. Right, it's time now for the regular briefing on the COVID-19 situation here in Korea for this Thursday. Now, as we've been saying, among the major concerns with regard to the latest domestic trend in daily infections is reportedly the reality that they are spread out across the country within both professional and private settings, including schools, workplaces, churches, gyms, restaurants and so forth. Accordingly, authorities are reiterating the importance of watching your distance, washing your hands and wearing your face mask. And speaking of wearing face masks, the failure to adorn them will result in fines, especially in indoor public places where they are now mandatory. The fines will be 100,000 won. Also on the topic of fines, the act of eating at places outside of your home or dining and drinking establishments will result in fines of 100,000 won as well. Now we are waiting for the briefing to start and we'll come back to you afterwards with a summary of it. First of all, we have a Mr. Pei Gyeong Taek who will be briefing us today. 
First of all, we would like to carry out some updates on the COVID-19 vaccination status. Yesterday alone, we had over 131,228 people who received their first dose, and a total of 1,903,767 people have been administered with their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccines. And a number of second-dose recipients now stands at 60,622. And last Friday, on the 16th of uh, February, uh, of April, our daily recipients number surpassed 100,000 for the first time, and this week we are seeing about 120 and 130,000 on a daily uh, basis, and this is a stark increase from uh, the uh, early um, uh, April, which is a jump by three folds when we had our daily recipients hovering around 46,000. And the next week, we will be rolling out the vaccines to people who are working at the um, hospitals and clinics, as well as those with um, dialysis, those undergoing dialysis, as well as uh, essential service workers, including policemen and firefighters and so forth. We will be expanding the scope of these eligible recipients, and we believe that we can speed up our inoculation speed going forward. And these people starting from next week will be uh, receiving their uh, doses at designated hospitals, and these um, also do not need additional uh, consent uh, process, they need to also reserve uh, their um a vaccination prior a day before their actual vaccination date on the online nudity. And starting from today, we have 29 more vaccination centers opening today, and a total of 204 will be operating as forward. And these 29 vaccination centers to be uh, newly focused include those at Busan, Incheon, Chungnam, uh, Gyeongbuk, Gyeongnam, Jeju, and so forth. And as for the details, please refer to the press kit that we have given to you earlier. And through this, we believe that in uh, in the middle of April, we believe uh, that we will have at least one vaccination set up, uh, a vaccination center set, set up at uh, each of the cities or provinces or counties. And we will also expand the accessibility to these vaccination centers, especially for those over the age of 75. And until end of April, we will have uh, the um, vaccination centers to open by 200 64. And once we expand the uh, uh, vaccination recipients to include the essential social workers, and if we also build more infrastructure, we believe that we, our speed will also uh, speed up as well. And on the uh, starting from the 22nd of April, we will also rolling out additional vaccine doses, uh, the second doses, that is, for people aged over the age of 75. And these include the people who have been receiving the Pfizer vaccines. And as for the senior citizens, starting from today, the, uh, this is the third week since they received their first dose. And starting from today uh, onwards, they will be receiving their consecutive second dose. On the first day of this uh, day, uh, we also have about 49 um, vaccination centers nationwide, which have carried out the first dose uh, vaccination. And we have seen uh, that about 19,000 of them nationwide will receive their second dose. And with this, we believe that we can significantly decrease uh, the risk of infection among the senior citizens as well. And next, as for the safety of the vaccines and for the post-inoculation adverse responses, here are some updates. According to EMA, they have said uh, that on the 20th of April, they said that regarding the Yansen vaccines, they said the benefits of the uh, inoculation, especially and they carried out the safety of the vaccines as uh, amid the concerns of blood clots. And the EMA has concluded that the rare blood clots that could accompany uh, the Janssen vaccines uh, is an is classified as a very rare um, uh, side effect, and they also agreed to uplist in this in the uh, manual. And this means that about... Um, 
7 million of them who received uh, the uh, Janssen vaccines, uh, they saw that six cases of blood clots have been uh, observed, and they said that they were also um, among most uh, female, and also they most of them were under the age of 60. And to this, the EMA says these side effects is very rare, uh, saying uh, that the effectiveness of these uh, vaccines outweighs uh, the uh, risks of side effects, and they also said that um, rolling out uh, the Janssen vaccines uh, should also be carried out at each of the nations. And also to this end, the European countries have agreed to resume uh, the rolling out of the Janssen vaccines. And Johnson & Johnson also said uh, that they will resume the supply of the vaccine going forward. And the same applies to Korea. We are undergoing uh, pre preparations. Uh, right now, a total of... Uh, out of the total number of um total number of uh, adverse responses, uh, post-inoculation adverse responses, we have had about 12,732, which is the total number of adverse responses. Uh, and this has steadily uh, also decreased to about 0 0.1 eight percent which has been on a steady decline and out of them 98.3 percent were mild and common symptoms after inoculation including muscle pain headache fever and nausea and lately, uh, people also have said uh, that there were some paralysis and also there was a report of an uh, assistant nurse in her 40s who experienced uh, paralysis after uh, the inoculation. And following this report, the quarantine authorities have met uh, the patient and also their guardians. And we have sent our words of comfort and we will be providing uh, them assistance and reviewing the assistance right now. And and considering uh, the time uh, needed for a review, we will be linking uh, this case with um, the uh, current uh, medical uh, infrastructure and we will be uh, rolling out the uh, medical treatment cost. And as for similar cases, we will be helping out the citizens to reduce their uh, burden and we will also provide a tailored uh, medical assistance and support for these people going forward. And we believe that we will have a one-on-one -on -one matching of the patient and an, uh, and an uh, public uh, officer who will be monitoring uh, the situations going forward. And if needed, we will also be providing emergency relief plans for these people so that there are no gray area for welfare assistance. And last but not least, here are some details on our antivirus measures. At, as for the high-risk facility that are prone to uh, these infections, we have carried out the preemptive testings. And we, by expanding uh, the uh, preemptive testings, we were able to identify uh, the patients at an early pace, and we were able to isolate them and treat them as well. And at nursing hospitals and long-term care centers, as well as uh, correctional facilities, we have been carrying out regular uh, preemptive uh, testings and also we have been carrying out uh, the similar measures for uh, businesses with higher risks of COVID-19 infection and we have seen uh, that the effectiveness of these have been proven by decreasing uh, the effect uh, the rate of uh, infection and as for these uh, preemptive testings that have been mandatory uh, until uh, last or uh, late last uh, week uh, le late last uh, year that is and we believe uh, that after the regular testings uh, that have been carried out starting from early this year to March, we have been able to significantly decrease the number of infections. And we believe that we were able to contain the virus spread to a large extent at these high risk facilities. And we believe that it is very crucial uh, to carry out these measures uh, going forward as well. And next, as for the South African variant uh, influx, we have have some details. Starting from today, everyone flying in directly from Tanzania, we will be also uh, carrying out mandatory quarantine for them as well. And to this end, the KCDA says that according to latest statistics, we see uh, that um, 
we have seen the effectiveness of the vaccinations and if your turn has arrived we ask you to uh, participate in uh, the inoculation pro program and currently we are carrying out the inoculations for care providers and uh, especially for these people please note that inoculation is uh, aimed at protecting not only yourself but also uh, those who are who you are carrying right now so to this end the government will also highlight uh, the importance of providing uh, necessary information on inoculation and also uh, with the aim of increasing the participation rate in our inoculation program. And we believe that vaccination itself can protect ourselves and also it can also protect our neighbors and also those who are vulnerable to COVID-19. And it is the most um, accurate and most effective as well as most uh, scientific way uh, to uh, return to a state of normalcy as soon as possible. So we ask you to also take care of your elderly parents to get vaccinated if their turn has arrived. So when your turn has arrived, please watch your personal uh, health conditions and also get uh, inoculation on a very uh, safe and um, stable environment. And even after the inoculation, you need to also carry out uh, quarantine measures like wearing face masks and washing your hands and keeping distance. And we will also uh, stick to the basics and we will also continue to exert our full efforts to contain the virus and also speed up our inoculation as well. Thank you very much. Right, that was the afternoon briefing for this Thursday. What was the gist of the briefing today? Uh, well, the government is putting efforts to expand vaccination and also, uh, you know, have more swift vaccination process. Uh, 29 new, new vaccination centers have been opened. Uh, that raises the total to 204. And the official mentioned that by the end of April, the government aims to have 264 vaccination centers by the end of this month. And also there will be an expansion of people essential to society uh, that will become subject to uh, the vaccination program. Uh, he also mentioned that there is going to be stronger monitoring uh, for adverse reactions and also uh, more efforts on compensation regarding such uh, adverse responses. Uh, he also mentioned that there's been a significant rise in the vaccination numbers. Uh, on the April 16th was the first time in the country at over 100,000 vaccinations in a day and uh, since April 2nd we're seeing a threefold increase uh, back then we had some 40,000 and now we have over uh, 120,000 or 130,000 inoculations a day and last but not least there's also been an update on uh, the government's efforts to protect the nation of variants from South Africa so beginning today uh, people flying in from South Africa and Tanzania will have to get into quarantine at special isolation facilities. Right, right, Sua, thank you for that. My pleasure. Right, up next, we take a look at efforts by authorities here to expand their vaccine arsenal amid the current global resurgence and procurement struggles. The Ministry of Food and Drug Safety approved Janssen's vaccine on April 7th, the third vaccine to be approved in Korea. Janssen's product is a single-dose vaccine, unlike many of its counterparts, with an efficacy rate of 66.9% in clinical trials. However, the U.S. has suspended the use of Janssen vaccines following reports of post-inoculation blood clots among vaccinated Americans. The EMA, Europe's drug regulator, said there may be a possible link between the Janssen vaccine and the blood clots, but maintained that the benefits of the vaccine still outweigh the risks. Amid worries over the shortage of vaccines in the country, the government announced a deal with Novavax to manufacture their vaccines in Korea under a technology transfer agreement. The two-dose Novavax vaccine had an efficacy rate of 96.4% in Phase 3 clinical trials 
and was also found to provide 86% protection against the UK variant. However, with more clinical trials still left to be conducted, it may take some time for Novavax shots to earn regulatory approval in Korea. Novavax vaccine 자체가 승인이 언제 날지가 확실치가 않은 상황이라서 여러 가지 불확실성이 남아는 있습니다만은 일단 이 Novavax가 승인을 받고 사용을 한다면은 국내에서는 게임 체인저가 될수 있을 것이기 때문에 가능한 한 우리는 승인 신청을 받았을 때 최대한 빨리 승인을 할수 있는 또 여러 가지 시스템들을 마련되는 데 있어서 적극적인 대책 또 여러 가지 지원들이 필요한 시점이라고 보겠습니다. Chinese vaccines and Russia's Sputnik V are also being looked to as an alternative and as a possible solution to the global supply crunch. Phase 3 trials of Russia's Sputnik V showed an efficacy rate of 91.6%, attracting the attention of many countries that had initially shunned the vaccine over concerns stemming from the lack of clinical data. On April 21st, South Korean President Moon Jae-in ordered government officials to review the possible adoption of Russia's Sputnik V. 효과에 대해서는 이미 이제 유명한 저널에서 발표가 되어 있고 외부 사람들이 검증을 하고 있기 때문에 효과성에 대해서는 저는 크게 우려하지 않습니다만 백신이라고 하는 게 효과적이고 안전해야 하거든요. 그러니까 안전성에 대한 추가적인 자료 공개가 더 필요하다라는 입장인 거죠. 중국 백신이든 스푸트니크 비든 간에 자료 확보와 근거를 이제 확보하려는 노력은 계속 되어야 된다고 보는데요. 중국 백신도 중국에 거주하고, 거주하고 계시는 한국 국민들 같은 경우에 접종을 하실 거고요. 스푸트니크 비도 이분 이 백신을 접종하고 우리나라에 귀국하시는 분들이 있으실 겁니다. 근데 그런 분들을 감안을 해서서라도 자료 확보의 노력은 계속 되어야 된다고 생각합니다. A possible rollout of new vaccines is certainly welcome news. But thorough reviews and other precautions will need to be taken for the safe and effective use of these vaccines. April 22nd marks the Global Day of Environmental Action. Now, this year, the day will also see an international climate summit in session virtually and another relevant gathering here in Capital Seoul late next month. For more on the green agendas amid the pandemic, I have Professor Chung Seo Jung from Korea University. Pleasure to have you with us, Professor Chung. Hello. And I also have Mr. Chang Da Ul from Greenpeace East Asia Seoul office. It's been a while, Mr. Chang. Yes, thanks for having me. Right then, Professor Chung, some claim that COVID-19, among other things, has served to sound the alarm on climate change. Do you agree? Uh, yes, I do. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, there have been already a lot of the studies by the scientists about the correlationship between the pandemic, uh, COVID-19, and then its impact on the climate change and vice versa. For instance, that uh, last year in Saudi Arabia, when the Saudi hosted G20 in a summit meeting, they went through a study about the correlation among the issues of the health and the climate and the digital even, and then scientists found that there are clear correlation and this should be the basis to further address the whole these issues together. So there are, there are many relationships between these two issues. And another scientific study revealed the fact that in Siberia, for instance, due to the meltdown of the tundra, there have been a lot of the virus which we thought that the dead actually revived and then, then you know, they, they became alive and then it caused a lot of deaths. Uh, to the people. So uh, unless we address the climate change, ac actually we will see another round of the pandemic, not only COVID-19, maybe more serious one in the future. 
A very frightening outlook, of course. Now, Mr. Chang, the last time we, you were here, we talked about how lockdowns in the early stages of the pandemic <coughs> right. led to cleaner air. What is the situation like now? Well, because of the lockdowns and because of the reduced industrial activities, yes, we do, we do have cleaner skies and cleaner river. But when it comes to the, the biggest environmental issues, climate change, even though the annual emission of 2020 reduced by 6% compared to 2019 level, but it doesn't mean that the climate change has, you know, has been better. We can never improve the global warming. We can only slow down the pace. So even though the annual emission was reduced by, compared to 2019, still we are emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and the global warming is getting worse. We can only make it less worse. So, and also when we talk about the recovery from the COVID-19, people are talking about economic recovery and going back to normal. But going back to normal is not an option because the past, the normal, was already a crisis of climate change. So we need to build back better and we need to think of how to uh, implement green recovery in order to not only getting over from the COVID-19, but also uh, changing the social economic system based on decarbonization. So that's the future we need to pursue. Right, and perhaps with that in mind, Professor Zhang, U.S. President Joe Biden is hosting a virtual climate summit on this Earth Day with some 40 global leaders. What are your thoughts on this latest effort by the U.S. to perhaps reassert its leading role on global matters? Well, I think uh, it has many uh, important implications in many senses uh, in terms of how to address the climate change crisis, uh, as Mr. Zhang just uh, emphasized on. First of all, when you look at the global landscape in terms of the leadership uh, to address climate, and uh, we cannot address the climate change problem without the uh, United States. It's very unfortunate for us not to have the United States in present for the last about the four years before President Biden was elected. And then now, President Biden uh, already indicated that the U.S. Uh, has a set of very ambitious uh, you know, target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And then beyond that, it uh, provided pretty good ideas on how it can uh, further uh, implement uh, you know, target uh, at the ground level by creating jobs and also boosting economy as well. For instance, that uh, it, he uh, already committed uh, to put a lot of uh, federal budget to boost the infrastructure matters and the focusing on the transportation, digital, and other matters. That also, I'm sure that, as I said, will boost the uh, you know, solutions uh, you know, that the world leaders will explore. So in that sense that U.S. Uh, will provide another inputs uh, similar but different from the EU and also China will respond more uh, to the global efforts on climate uh, because of the U.S. Uh, relationship and its encouragement actually to, the, to, the, to China uh, about this issue. Right, and China has vowed, of course, to tackle the issue with urgency. Right. Uh, Mr. Chang, do tell us a bit about the significance of this summit with regard to the Globe's Green Campaign. Well, last time when I was here, I was talking about the global scientific consensus that in order to prevent the climate catastrophe, we need to limit the global temperature increase within the 1.5 degrees Celsius. And in order to do that, we need to make carbon neutral society until 2050, net zero emissions until 2050. And in order to achieve carbon neutral until 2050, we need to make it half of our global greenhouse gas emissions right now until within 10 years. So until 2030, we need to make a 50% reduction of our greenhouse gas emission levels. And that's the scientific requirement. But many countries submitted their targets on, uh, until the end of last year. But recently in February, the UNFCCC made the latest report saying that based on the submission, of, based on the goals submitted by the 72 countries covering 30% of the global greenhouse gas emissions, our target is 50%. But actually, the, the conclusion was 0.5% reduction only. So the, there is a stark discrepancy between the scientific goal and the reality. That's why the US is right now initiating to make the major emitting countries to have a ambitious targets with, with, the, with the summit. And as Professor said, the US is expected to say that they are going to reduce more than 50% by 2030, and Japan, Japan will also double their targets. 
and UK will announce 78% of the reduction by 2035, very ambitious goals. So other, other countries, including South Korea, will get huge pressure to meet these ambitions in the summit, and that's the key point I for see. the summit. And apart from their declarations of like dropping their emissions rate, are there any like tangible plans out there? Will they be discussing any tangible plans in the summit? Yes, uh, they are discussing about how to financing the, as the professor said, how to financing the infrastructures, how to financing the increase of the renewables, how to how to finance the car industry to convert from the internal combustion engine based industry to the electric vehicles and hydrogen electric vehicles industries. There is no magic blood to, to cut the greenhouse gas emissions unless we cut down the, the use of the coal in the electricity generation, unless we reduce the number of the internal combustion engine vehicles and change to the EVs and HEVs. These are the, the ways we need to you know, take in order to achieve the carbon neutrality. Right. Professor Chung, in a recent opinion piece, you claim that this summit hosted by Mr. Biden may provide Korea with the chance to play a pivotal role in fighting climate change. Could you elaborate, please? Right. Uh, as you may know, that uh, Republic of Korea, our country, is uh, one of the very few uh, countries which were very poor in the 1670s and became the, one of the leading economies of the world. So even the, with that record, uh, Korea is uh, very well positioned in the playing a bridging role between the developed and developing countries. And in the past, actually, Korea's uh, you know, diplomacy and climate has been set in this context by hosting global climate change organizations such as Global Green Growth Institute in Seoul and the Green Climate Fund in Songdo. These are two major uh, global climate change organizations by providing help to developing countries. So if Korea can share its uh, past experience and current experiences, in addition, if Korea can demonstrate how we can uh, you know, play with the developing world through Indonesian organizations, no other country can play a better role than Korea. And I do hope that uh, in this summit meeting, Republic of Korea, my country, uh, would like to emphasize this important uh, contribution, possible contributions by Korea. I'm sure that we can do that. Right, and speaking about contributions, Professor John, come late May, Seoul will host the P4G Seoul Summit yes. here in the capital city. Now, could you tell us a bit about the agenda on this summit? Well, a P4G summit meeting uh, is also a summit level meeting, but it has a very distinctive feature because it focuses on technology aspect of the climate change issues by boosting private sector investment uh, based on the concept of public-private partnership. And then we need to uh, expand the market where private sectors can comfortably invest their resources in boosting low carbon economy and then, then governments, uh, some of the middle income countries such as Republic of Korea and the Denmark can play its role with the partner developing countries such as Ethiopia. So in the sense that uh, P4G uh, focuses on very specific aspect of the climate change issues, uh, especially financing and technology. And these are two main issues in terms of implementing the Paris Agreement by the United Nations system. So based on the, some of the best practices that the P4G summit meeting can discuss about, and actually we can the, provide the good inputs to upcoming Glasgow COP, and then thereby Korea can further its leadership role, and I do hope that the uh, Republic of Korean government will do that role in this summit meeting uh, next month. Right, and Mr. Chung, staying with what Professor uh, Chung has just said, as the chair of the P4G summit this year, what can Korea do, what efforts can it make to perhaps better demonstrate its uh, potential role or commitment to the fight against yes. climate change? Well, South Korea, unfortunately, has been one of the main funders of the coal fire power plant in developing countries, mainly in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Many advanced countries have decided not to further invest in coal fire power plant in developing countries, but now mainly China, Japan, and Korea are the three villains of still investing the coal fire power plant. Are we but, like the third largest investor in overseas coal projects then? Yes, but there is an expectation that South Korea will declare no more overseas public finance, no more public financing on overseas coal project, either at the climate summit uh, starting from tomorrow or at the P4G meeting. That might be the very concrete step to show that how Korea want to play in the leadership role in climate action.
I see. And staying with that, with Stichang, President Moon, as we saw in the video back in October, vowed to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. What policies do you propose to promote this policy? Well, 2050 is after 30 years, right? In order to become carbon neutral by 2050, we need a concrete policy and steps right now within 10 years. And it can include the increase of the renewable energy targets. Right now, we have 20% target by 2030. It should be more than doubled. And also, we need to set the year of phasing our coal fire power plant in South Korea. And also, there is a discussion in many uh, advanced countries to introduce a policy of banning internal combustion engines in new car sales. For example, UK will ban the no more gasoline and diesel cars in the new car sales market from 2030. Norway will do from 2025. And we have 24 million cars in Korea, and less than 1% are EVs and HEVs. So in order to tackle the climate change, there is no way but to introduce the regulations, as well as the carbon tax could be also another very good policy to address climate change in terms of the, the economic you know, mechanism. Right. Professor Chong, in the long term, what efforts must be made by the international community then to address climate change? Right. Uh, in the long run, I think uh, there are several points that we need to focus on. First of all, we need to raise the awareness of the importance of the issue, right? Without having the good understanding on this, nobody can do anything. So that's number one. Number two, that awareness raising uh, should come with uh, you know, good solutions which might uh, provide uh, sort of the ideas on how to boost the uh, economy and how to provide a better welfare and then how to better manage the whole society in a climate friendly way. And to do so, number three, I think this is the most important factor is that considering that we don't have the world government to coordinate everything, coordination is the key to achieve all these ideas. And to do so, as uh, we are discussing today, there are very good venues to, to work on. For instance, the UN process, that's the UNFCC climate change process, and the US-led climate change summit meeting. You know, they are working on some global countries, uh, emitting more than 80% of the total global emissions. And the European Union has uh, provided their good ideas on how to implement the Green New Deal and the circular economy and others. And I'm sure that China will respond to us and then among them, in addition to them, the developing countries such as African countries, Latin American countries can work together. So uh, Republic of Korea you know, can be related to every venue and then we can work together with all the leaders and that's the thing that in the long run we should do. Right. Mr. Chang, you recently shared your thoughts in an opinion piece about the importance of corporate Korea partaking in efforts to transition from fossil fuels to renewables. Could you tell us a bit more about this thought? You mean the role of the corporations? Right. Well, in terms of, for example, electricity consumption, our industry consumes about around 56% of the total electricity, whereas the household only consumes about 14%. So unless the the large corporations in Korea, including Samsung Electronics, Samsung Display, LG Display, Postco, Hyundai Steel, unless they change the sources for their electricity consumption from the fossil fuels to the renewables, there is no way for South Korea to drastically reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. And in order to do that, I mean, company cannot install solar panels and wind, wind, wind powers by themselves for their whole consumption, but they can purchase from the renewable energy development project. And until last year, there was no policy in South Korea except for self-installation for the companies to procure the renewable energy. But for, from this year, there are five additional options are available. So now, right now is the time for the companies to show their leadership as well as their ambitions to take part in addressing the climate change. And we are expecting more and more companies to join the global campaigns like uh, RD100, which is Renewable Electricity 100. There are already 300 global companies joined this campaign, committing, sourcing their 100% uh, their uh, power consumption from the renewable sources already. And SK, uh, the six subsidiary companies under SK Group already joined the RE100, and recently the LG Energy Solution and Amore Pacific also joined this, uh, this initiative. So these, these are the ways companies can actually make real difference 
by, by participating in this kind of initiative. Of course. Professor Chang, compared to other forms of diplomacy, some people say that climate diplomacy is one of the most challenging. As a scholar in the field of international relations yourself, what are your thoughts? Do you agree? Well, you are asking me about the question in the context of the Korea, of course, right? And then I've been working on climate for more than 25 years in the past, and I've been saying to the government and to the whole society is that if we want to look for a possible area where Korea can play a leadership role, I think climate is the most uh, possible area to work on, simply because of the reasons that I already set out today. And then actually, climate regime is pretty new to everybody, including the advanced developed countries. Uh, you know, Paris Agreement came in in 2015. It has a totally different approach on how to address climate change. You know, we set a very ambitious goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but there are solutions, right? That this is the, what the Paris Agreement tries to indicate, and this came to us in 2015. So this is new to everybody. So if a Korea make a good, best practice, that not only works well for Korea, but for the entire world, especially for the developing countries, and I think uh, we can be uh, one of the good leaders. We can dominate the world, but we can be uh, one of the good leaders in the world. Right. Professor Zhang, thank you very much for your insights. And Mr. Zhang, as always, thank you for your thoughts as well. Thank you. Right. Now, some are claiming the COVID-19 crisis may prove to be a climate change opportunity if commitment is followed by immediate action today. Thank you for watching.